Today, we welcome in the governor, the mayor, the lieutenant of the Nick fan base, the second best Nick fan that I know to me, CP the franchise. I appreciate you. Thank you for coming on, bro. Anytime, man. Anytime. Hope you're doing well. Listen, we can't do a Nick recap or a preview of the next season or an off season without talking to this guy because he's got all the info. So there was no other show I was going to do. Obviously, I know every one of you wanted to hear some Nick stuff from me, and we had to get this guy to do that. So before we dive in, let's do RIP. Shout out to Bill Walton and his family. Yeah. Obviously, that's sad news. One of the legends of the game. And CP, did you ever ever get a chance to like interview him or come across him in any way? Unfortunately, not. Never met him. Was never in the same room as him. But um, you know, obviously, a, a legend of our game. A legend of from a media side, from a from a NBA player side. Uh, just just a true legend of the game. And, and so he's going to be sorely missed for sure. Yeah, and I think he's one of the first guys to go from being a great player to a great analyst to a great color guy. Like he's one of the first guys to come into the media space from being a great player and then be great in both industries. Yeah. So he was kind of a pioneer in that way. No question. And, and he did it his way on his terms, which, which I respect a whole lot about guys. Like he crafted his own brand, yep. you know, it, it was never polished. It was never buttoned up. He said what he felt, but he called the game. He called the great game. And so, yeah, yep. like, like I said, it's a huge loss. Um, for the basketball world, man, huge giant. Yeah, and he was kind of the Charles Barkley before Charles Barkley, kind of in a way. Yeah, he brought that kind of humor to the to the broadcast. Um, so let's dive in. Let's dive right in. Mm -hmm. When you watch the Celtics on a scale of one to ten, how annoyed are you when you watch them, knowing how vulnerable they are? That if the Knicks were healthy, that they actually could have been in the finals. Ten on a scale of one to ten, ten being the most annoying. 10. I, I watch these Eastern Conference Finals, these Conference Finals, and it's, it's again, I, I call this off postseason for the Knicks, the biggest what if for the yeah. Knicks. I, I said that, look, they're, they're still going to have a good run, but at the end of it, you're going to be wondering what if. And that was just based off of Julius Randle injury. Then as you kept going, you lost Bo Boyan Bogdanovich, you lost Mitchell Robinson, you lost Ochi Ananobi, and you're still fighting. So it, it's, it's just tough, man, because these Celtics – they are vulnerable. I wouldn't say they're easy, but they are vulnerable. No, they're vulnerable. And this Knicks team, the, the team that we saw in January that went 14-2, and two, that was clicking on all cylinders uh, based on the impact of the Ananobi trade, it, it just left you thinking like, damn, this team could have went to the finals. I truly believe it. So I didn't get a, I didn't get a number from 1 to 10. How annoyed? 10. 10. 10. 10. Okay, 10. Me too. Yeah, it's um, hard to I watch, also man. think that even without Randall, they would have had a chance to beat Boston if the rest of the guys didn't get hurt. You would have needed Bogey, I think, yeah. and Mitch and, and OG and all those guys to be able to beat them. But I think even without Ryan, Randall, they would have had a chance with Randall for sure. Yeah, I think offensively they could have provided that depth if Boyan Bogdanovich could have been, you know, close to himself. I think he was yep. playing a little bit better in that Philadelphia series and then yep. un um, unfortunately gets rolled up on by uh, by Nicholas Batum. You had McBride who was shining bright in that Philadelphia series. And if Brunson is still him, you know, I think they could have given it a good a good fight. I think they could have given Boston a good run, man. It's just I agree. unfortunate. Those injuries and it are just would have been sports, nice to man. see that. Yeah, it's part of the game, you know? Part of the game. It would have yeah. been, I think it's going to be tough for the front office in this offseason because they didn't get a chance to evaluate the team that they would have had this year to say, okay, hey, if they had Randall, if they had OG, if they had Brunson, hey, if they got swept by Boston, they would have said, okay, maybe we need a second star to go along with Jalen. But if they had played Boston seven games or even gone to the finals, then they might have been like, okay, maybe we just make a tweak here and there, and this team's good enough to win an NBA championship. But I don't think they got that answer this year. And that, I think, was the most unfortunate part of the season. Yeah, that, that's why I say what if. And Julius yep. is, is the big factor in it because last year he's dealing with the ankle injury. So ineffective. The year before that, they didn't make the playoffs. The year before that, he was you know a deer in the headlights, just not yep. the guy that took them to the playoffs, although a lot of people want to give him credit for it. And, and he deserves it. But you're still left thinking like, damn, like, is this enough? Do we have enough as we move forward into the offseason? Those are the questions that Leon Rose and World Wide West, those are the questions they're going to have to answer. So before we get to that, a quick thing on the Pacers series, Game 7. Did you feel like that they shouldn't have brought OG back because he wasn't ready? Or were you under like, oh, let's bring him back, Willis Reed, let's give the motivation and the inspiration to the team? Or were you in the camp of, 
it was kind of too desperate to bring him back and it just yeah. didn't make any sense. Well, it, he only played five minutes, so I don't I don't think it it hurt them per se. I think it was worth the shot to see how he felt out there, what he looked like, and then when he got out there, his gait was, you know, nowhere close to, to what it should be. So I think Tom Thibodeau did the right thing. He saw it. We all saw it on the TV like, yeah, he's not right. So he gave him the quick hook. But I think in a game seven, when you it's do or die right now, the team has their backs against the wall. It's got to be all hands on deck. And, you know, Josh Hart made it his effort. OG wanted to give it a try, and he did. He came out with the, the five miraculous points. But, uh, you know, the, they did the right thing by keeping him out after that because he clearly wasn't the same guy. Yeah, I agree. And I think overall there were some people who said that, you know, the Pacers got seven basically. And I rewatched actually the game. I can't believe I actually did it, but I rewatched <laughs> yeah. the first three quarters of the game because I wanted to see I was at the game. It's a different perspective when you're Way there, different. you're emotionally into it. You're kind of in a different space. I wanted to watch it from a different lens and see, okay, how many open shots did they get? Cause when I was live, I felt like they got so many open looks and obviously shooting 67% and 76 in the first half, I think it was, you know, that you're going to win most games doing that. But I felt like the Knicks really helped them because of the fact, a, they were, I thought they were tired mm -hmm. and I don't know if you felt this too, but I really felt like game five was an anomaly. Game four, six, and seven, they looked tired in all three of those games. Yeah. And I think that played into the game seven, them Pacers shooting well and getting such open looks. But some people thought that with OG out there, they're basically playing five on four. And that led to the Pacers getting, seeing the ball going in the basket early, getting open looks. And that was the reason that spearheaded them having such a good shooting game. Do you yeah. play into that or not really? Listen, man, me and you, we were we were at game four with Knicks against Philly. And yeah. the way they left that game, I was like, damn, I don't know how much they have left for even that yeah. series. And so, you know, I tell fans all the time every single year. So the playoffs is as much of an endurance test as it is about talent and skill. You've got to be able to get through physically and mentally just to move on game after game, round after round. This is after game 82. When you yeah. went through the entire marathon of a regular season. And so I'm with you, man. I just felt like mentally, physically, these guys really didn't have much to give. You saw that out there in their effort. You saw it with their mental mistakes, you know, common mistakes that guys like a Jalen Brunson doesn't make. They yep. can't inbound the ball. Just like, yep. you know, just certain, certain things you just watch with the team and, and having watched the team over the course of a season, you know, that's uncharacteristic of them. So at that point, I just felt like, you know, it was time. The right, the paces were hitting at a record pace. And the Knicks, you know, with OG going out and then Brunson going out, it, it was just time. Time to it was too it much up. to handle. And I think the game that they screwed up was game three. Yeah. That was the yeah. game they had to get if they were going to win that series. Because once OG got hurt, and I was at game two, and I said to my brother, I said, we weren't even that happy. Because we mm. saw him blow a tire. And you knew at that point, he was, it was most likely he wasn't going to come back in that yeah. series, at yeah. least. Yeah. And... I was just like, without OG, this is going to you know, I know we're up 2-0 already, and you, you have to win only, you know, they have to win four or five games, but that's one of your most, that's one of the guys you can't afford to lose. No. Aside, aside from Jalen, he's probably the next guy you can't afford to lose. And I think game three was the game they had to get up nine with nine minutes to go. If you're shorthanded, I always say when you're the underdog or you're the shorthanded team, you can't blow games. No. You have to win games that, that are there for you for the taking. And I felt like losing that game that was the beginning of the end to the series with the injuries that they had with the fatigue and everything else set in. Um, so with that said, I, I want to get your, cause there's been so much obviously on Tibbs, mm -hmm. right? With the injuries and what side people are on. Did he play the guys too many minutes Did he not play the guys too many minutes? I'm going to tell you my opinion, but I want to get yours first. Mm -hmm. What side of the line are you on with Tibbs? Or did he play the guys too many minutes, which led to some of these injuries? Or do you feel like it was more of a fluke thing and he had no choice, but to play the guys he was yeah. playing? I think I think it was a fluke thing. The latter, man. I'm going with the latter. A lot of fans uh, I've been debating with about it, and you know, fans feel like they can just say, "Well, it's obvious that he's playing these guys too many minutes." Well, yeah. you know, what type of measurement is obvious? I'm looking for objective facts that say playing guys too many minutes can lead to this injury. That I don't see the direct correlation. You can get a hamstring injury in the beginning of a season. You can get a hamstring injury in the end of the season. Look at Tyrese Halliburton. Middle, yep. you know close to the second half starts he pulls up with a bad hamstring injury right yep. is that overuse who knows you know josh Hart with the abdominal we see how many times we see baseball players in the beginning of a season go out with an oblique strain 
is that is that overuse? Is that going too hard? It's just hard to really know. What 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 I do know is based on the guys that were on the team, those were the guys that needed to play the major minutes. Once you made the RJ and quickly trade for OG and Precious, you lost its depth. All right, then you lose Julius. Next guy's got to step up. That's Josh Hart. You know, in a perfect world, Josh Hart's coming off your bench, right? If Julius Randle is healthy, and so it was, it's it's a next man up situation. Everybody that played had to play, and you really didn't have that many options left on the bench. I mean, people like you know play the guys on the bench. They they played so well in the game four blowout, and I'm like, you know, no, I'm not looking for Daquan Jeffries and, yeah, and Jacob Toppin, right? To, yeah, I'm not looking for Jacob Toppin to save our season here. Like it was just a little unrealistic to expect much from those back end of the rotation guys? I think, for me, I'm like it right in the middle. Um, from this standpoint. Mm-hmm. I think, for the most part, you had to play. The, you're not playing the end of the bench, guys. Let, let's just be, no offense to Jacob Toppin or Jeffries. Right. They're, they're not real basketball players, okay? They're G-leaguers slash at the end of the bench, guys. We're not talking about them. The one mistake I think he made was not playing Burks earlier in the playoffs. And okay. I think he proved it in the Pacers series that he was capable of playing in the playoffs. Mm-hmm. And he was a guy that he had on the team a few years ago was a key contributor to that, whatever that was, 2020 team. Yeah. And I, my opinion was when Bogey got hurt, he should have taken Bogey's minutes. That was my only complaint. Mm-hmm. Everything mm-hmm. else, I have no problem with what he did. I have no issue playing the minutes. But if he takes Bogey's minutes there, you still have an eight-man rotation. He's a scorer off the bench, which you actually needed. And he would have replaced Bogey in doing that role. Mm-hmm. And then he could have played 15 minutes. You could have taken a few minutes off Hart's plate. You could have taken a few minutes off OG's plate and then even Brunson who got banged up a few minutes off his plate. Mm-hmm. So that would be my only thing. And do I know that doesn't lead to the injuries? I have no idea. I don't think we'll ever know. And that's why I think people will say, oh, they got hurt because Tibbs. Like, right. We have no idea yeah, what no would have happened. Yeah. I don't think any of us know the real answer. But I think at the end of the day, the guys that they could have played who were NBA basketball players in the playoffs, Burks was the one guy that I thought, not before Bogey's injury, but once Bogey got hurt, he should have been out there taking his minutes, and then who knows what happens after that. And then I don't think anyone could have complained. Yeah. And I think that's my standpoint. Do you? How do you feel about that, Tate? Listen, man, anybody who watches my show knows I'm the Burks guy. I'm Burks <laughs> the Hive, Burks. The, the big money Burks. I'm the president of the Hive. But also just knowing Tibbs or, or knowing his tendencies since he's been yep. here, he's a guy that likes chemistry. He likes trust. He wants to be able to trust. And Burks did not earn his trust when he got here. He gave him every opportunity to show him that he belonged in the rotation. And Burks was just out there just playing in his own world. (laughs) Every time he had a bad game, like, yo, this guy's out there playing one on five. This is not the guy who I expected to come in here and contribute. And so I understood why Tibbs took him out of the rotation. McBride was playing well. He was on a rocket. He deserved those, those minutes. And so when, when Boyan Bogdanovich goes down, I was thinking the same. I'm like, is Burks going to play? But I don't, you know, I can understand Tibbs not going there because he was so bad. But then he he, and, uh, he proved us all wrong, came back in in, uh, in the Pacers series. And you're right. Like, Tibbs is big on trust. If he doesn't trust you, he's not going to play. No. I think we've seen that with guys in the past. Fournier, obviously, you know, for a couple of years. And we saw it in the playoffs last year when quickly had a bad couple of games. He kind of got buried in that Miami series. And, yeah. and even Grimes to some extent, too, because he was hurt. Yeah, um, I agree with that. I'm more of like the human being. I know Burks was traded midseason. That's always a tough scenario coming to a new team with a new role, mm-hmm. having to fit in with new guys. His family didn't move from Detroit. I know these are excuses. I don't want to make yeah. excuses. But as a coach, I'm always trying to figure figure out what I would be doing is, OK, there's reasons that Burks didn't play well. He's not washed up. He's only 31. Mm-hmm. He had a great first half of the season for Detroit, which is why you traded for him. So I just would have been okay being out of the rotation in the playoffs. But then once Bogey goes down, hey, play him in the second quarter. I always say you don't lose the game in the second quarter, which I firmly believe. If he yeah. doesn't play well, then you don't play him. And that's that would have been my only thing. But overall, I don't blame Tibbs. Mm-hmm. I think for the most part, he had to do what he had to do. The only thing for me was Burks. But I agree. I understand what you're saying about the trust thing, and I can't, I can't kill him for it. That just would have been what I did. Yeah. So with that said, I think the biggest win to me from this season was us the Nick fan base, Mm -hmm. right? Because I think everyone realized in the media, you saw ex-players who have podcasts, 
talking about how great the Nick fan base was, how they're like a European soccer fan base and how it's like they've never seen anything like it. So do you take full responsibility for that as the governor <laughs> of the Nick fan nah. base? Never, 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 man. I, I definitely can't do that. But I can say that uh, unequivocally, this this is the, the best fan base in sports. That That's just hands down. Um, the way that they get involved. You know, some people don't like the celebrations outside the garden. I say, I, I love it. You, you got one life to live. Go ahead and do it. If, you, if you're paying, you know, $1,500 for, for seats in the 400 sections of MSG yeah. after a win, go ahead and get your money's worth. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Like, make that all part of the experience. And so... Nah, man, it's it's uh you know the way this fan base is is supporting this team generationally. It's not just the young people. It's it's uh people from it's the seventies who've seen those championship teams, and the people from my era, which is the nineties, you know, that seen this team. And everyone has the same sentiment that this team really brought that energy back to to New York that was sorely missed for a long sure. time. Like you, you had teams that that had. A, a nice little season, right? The, the Knicks tape teams in 2012-13, Carmelo had a great year. They won 54 games and uh, the team last year. But this team, for some reason, it just really defined and embodied that grit and grind that, that New York was all about. And so it was great to see the fan base really rally around them. And I think one thing that people don't realize about New York, they think we're like this bougie city that's yeah. like, like we have glitz and glamour. Okay, we have a little bit of that as a city, but we're really a hard-nosed, blue-collar like we, if yeah. we haven't won a championship in fifty plus years, we'll love you if you leave everything out there on the floor. Look at like yeah. all the Nick Greats, Ewing, Sprewell, Houston, all these guys who have been. It, uh, Carmelo, he won one playoff series. He comes to the Garden, right. they shower him with with an applause. Like, yeah. we just want to know you left it all out there and you did everything you could for us as a fan base because we give everything to to you as players. And I think that's what people don't realize from people outside of New York, like how great the Nick fan base is because we just want to know that you give everything you have. And I think for us, you know, we're so hungry for that championship. And I think, you know, this, I, I love all sports, I'm baseball, ba uh, basketball, football, everything, but this is a basketball town when the, when the Knicks are great, there's nothing better yeah, than no, the guard. Yeah. No question about it. Uh, you know, if, when you look at some of the greats who are, you know, immortals in this town, they're not the superstars. They're not the divas. They're the guys who get it out the mud. Those yep. are the guys who we remember forever, man, because it's it's a great story, right? Like the, the Jalen Brunson story is a great story. Josh Underdog Hart, story. DiVincenzo, like this is why we love those Nova Knicks. You look at Precious Achua, him coming through. Like this whole team, when Julius went down, there was no lottery picks yep. in, in their run. And McBride, like everyone has that story where they're just grinding their way through uh, to the to the to the pinnacle, man. And and that's the story that New Yorkers really rally around. The underdog story. Underdog you know, all those story. guys were written off at some point and now they've come and they found a home and they're doing big things for the Knicks. So I'm gonna ask you this. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna put you on the spot. Mm -hmm. Everyone's questioning is Brunson the best Nick of all time. Yeah. Which it listen, it's early. He's only been here a couple of years. Where do you put him? Yeah with the greatest Knicks of all time? Is he ahead of Carmelo for you? Is he behind Carmelo? Where do you put him in the rankings? <sighs> greatest Nick? And like during their time, their time, during Knicks, right? Only when they were on the Knicks. I'll put him third. Behind who? I'll put him third behind Walt okay. and behind Ewing. Put him okay. third. That's I'll fair. Put I'll put That's Melo fair. a close fourth. Uh, Bronson already has, has had, you know, much more success um than, than Melo so far but you know I think Melo's teams were just poorly constructed but Agreed. I think Brunson has and will have a better Nick career than Carmelo uh based on one his play and two the competence of the front office I think he's in a better spot than Melo was for sure so last thing on this past season we'll get to the free agency Brunson said he didn't think the season was a success because they didn't get close to the championship and they didn't get close to the title yeah. when you get a chance to reflect as the governor Okay, you and mm -hmm. Perk, right? Mm -hmm. well, how do you kind of describe this Knicks season? Do you think it was a success? How do you view it? Yeah, without question, a success. I mean, I love his his mindset and his Me attitude too. because he wants better for himself and better for the team. He's a, he's a leader, natural born leader. Uh, you you look at the, he's cut from a different cloth. His family, great family, you know, level headed leaders yep. themselves, go getters, and so uh, you know th that mindset is, is what we need here. But to me, you you look at what they did. It was an outstanding season. You know, to get the second seed, to fight through. Get to Indiana. Yes, they didn't get there. They didn't get to the Eastern Conference Finals. But but look at the team. It was decimated yeah. by injuries. Uh, I said this plenty of times. There's no other team in the NBA that could have 
gotten through the playoffs and to the point where the Knicks did, like like the Knicks. To to survive those type of injuries, there's there's no other team that no one would have gotten to game seven, I don't even think. Like no. to get to game seven against Indiana. No. And Indiana's a good offensive team. They're a great home team. Like yeah. to get to that position with Brunson and basically, you know, what's left of Josh Hart and you know, the guys that they had out there, they were playing McBride and Precious. Yeah. No offense to them. They're they're really good complimentary players, but they're playing them big minutes down the stretch of games because that's what they had left. Yeah, no question. Um, to get the second seed, they made two trades yeah. in the middle of a season. They made two Crazy. trades in the middle of the season. The first one left a big gash in the bench, but then you had internal development from Miles McBride. You go out, you make the uh, the next trade for for Boyan and Burks. They're terrible, but ne- nevertheless, they're still able to get the number two seed because the OG trade was so impactful for them. And so to, to me, man, when, when you look at the career year that Brunson had, Randall making his third all-star team, even though he wasn't there for them. The internal developments of a Miles McBride. Look at what Precious Achua yep. did in that month of January to help contribute. Big contributions that I think get under overlooked. In right. My yep. um, Isaiah Hartenstein taking another step. When he gets the bag this year, this offseason, yep. he's got Tibbs to thank. He's got Brunson to thank and, and the whole team for, for making him a better player. DiVincenzo. I looked at Brunson's contract last year as the best contract in the sport. I look at DiVincenzo's <laughs> mid-level exception contract as the next yeah. best. And I think McBride's will be the next. No, nah, man, I, I thought there they were several wins for this team, both as individual players and for Coach Tibbs as a coach, um, that, you know, th- this is without question a successful season. I, I agree. With you. And I think, you know, a lot of that, Brunson gets so much credit, obviously, because he had such an incredible season. And I think he should get a lot of credit for that, especially what he did in the postseason with the team that they had left. But like you said, so many guys. And Parch, you got to give credit to Tibbs because I think he's evolved his coaching style a lot. This year, especially, his yeah. offensive system is different. He's willing. When was in the past, was he ever be willing to play Josh Hart at the four? Yeah. That's yeah. like completely against anything he's done in the past, playing a small ball lineup at times because he had to do it. And I think you got to give him a lot of credit, Brunson a lot of credit. And like you said, Dante, career year, Hartenstein, Insane. career year. Those guys were incredible. So my first question is we get to look to next year and we look forward. What do you do with Julius Randle? Um, you personally, would you trade yeah. him? Would you look to trade him? Would you only trade him if you got a player that you felt like was a big upgrade, in, you know, especially in the scoring department? Or how do you view him as a fit next yeah. season and going forward? It, it it has to come at an upgrade. There's only two players that I trade Julius Randle for right Go now. Ahead. It's Giannis, and as much as I hate to say this next one because fans, you know, get emotional that he that you know he uh, KD, KD, he bailed yeah. on the Knicks the first time he had a chance, but I think he's a perfect fit on this team. I'm just I just keep it real with fans. I'm like, yo, you guys got to put the emotion to the side. We're just talking basketball here. If that Phoenix experiment blows up, they started with the coach. Next thing is going to be James Jones, and then, by, you know, players might might be next, or if KD raises his hand. But if they had a shot at him, I would go with him. But other than that, I'm keeping Julius. What about Julius Booker? Here. I wouldn't trade you. Uh, no. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That, that's not necessarily Because I would do three guys, and I would include Booker with your two guys. I agree. Yeah. I don't care about emotions. I would say, you apologize to me, I'll put it behind. Yeah. You know what I mean? I don't care. It's in the past. He's a great player. If he's going to help us win, who cares? So I would agree with the two. I would yeah. add Booker to that. But why not Booker? For you, I'm not. I'm just looking at guys who could potentially ask out, right? Like Katie's had a he's had a reputation yeah. for just being like, yeah, hey, you know, it's not working out here. I'm gonna take my bag and leave. Giannis, I feel like that could potentially implode eventually. Mm-hmm. Um, but book, we don't we don't know. You know, like what is his, his relationship with Ishbia? He's a homegrown talent with the Suns. A lot of people want to put him here because of the relationship with Leon Rose, but he's not really one to necessarily voice his displeasure with things, or he hasn't as yet. At least I haven't heard it. Same. So I'm just going off of, like, guys who could potentially be out there. You just don't know until the offseason unfolds and, uh, you know, that disgruntled player raises his hand. And there's always someone that we don't expect. Always and someone. I, I only threw Booker out there because we know Phoenix has been very much a hot mess this past season. I think yeah. anyone could ask out from that group. I think Katie's a great option. I think Booker could be. But Book, I think – would be a great fit because you slide him right. I want a two or a four. Yeah. I don't yeah, want anyone yeah. in between, right? So you mm-hmm. slide him into the two. I put Dante on the bench as your super six man. And I think that would fit great. Perfect. 
And so I wouldn't, and I put Hart at the four and Hart would continue. But because mm-hmm. I think part of the reason why Hart was so great this year is because he got a chance to play the four mm-hmm. and him playing small ball with Hart and OG at the three and the four, whatever, you know, however you want to label them, I think was huge for the Knicks this year. So I wouldn't mind seeing that mm-hmm. if it meant getting Booker at the two. Um, I'm with you. I'm not just getting rid of Julius unless it was an upgrade. And yeah. I want to mention one player that a lot of Knicks fans want, a lot of them pine for that I don't think is as good a fit as a lot of them think, and that's Mikel Bridges. Mm. And I like Mikel Bridges a lot as a player. I think he's a terrific player. I think Julius is a better scorer and a better number two option than him, and I think the Knicks need that more than anything. And if they got Mikel Bridges, where would he play? I don't think he's a two guard. I think Dante's a better fit with the movement running off the ball, the athleticism at the two guard position than he is, and you already have Hart and OG at the other position. So to me, I don't think he's as good of a fit on this Knicks roster with or without Julius as all the Knicks fans do. Do you agree with that? Or would Mikel be someone you'd look to as well? I've always liked Mikel Bridges. Um, 20, uh, was it 2017 draft? Whichever draft that they dropped yeah. the ball completely we didn't and took pick. Kevin Knox. I, I, I was just, I was floored because I couldn't believe that they, they would pass up on this guy. I mean, he showed you the most tape on the biggest stage that he yeah. could be the three and D at least wing for for the new york knicks and uh and scott perry passed on him but you know i thought when he first got to the nets from phoenix he showed a little more potential from a shot creation standpoint and then kind of came back to the pack now was that a result of just not being happy there in brooklyn he doesn't seem happy there or is it the league kind of catching up with him being on a uh, not so good team i think that there's you know a little bit of both there but the next person, if you're going to move Julius, the person that you bring in, like you said, potentially a book, that person has to be able to bend defenses. I agree. He's got to be a guy that can command double teams, shadows, hard hedges, like guys that you have to pay attention to because it's just like, you know, you're watching Western Conference Finals right now in crunch time when you see Luka Doncic going one-on-one. And you're like, what is the defense? You yeah, can- I mean, he, the shots he's making are so absurd. Yeah. What do you even do up with that? Right. And, and and so you need someone who's going to command those doubles, who can yeah. make his team better just by his sheer presence. And so that's why, to me, when fans are like, oh, get rid of him. He's not clutch. He's not that. Yeah, those things could be true, but you don't just add by just getting rid of him yes, because I you're agree. putting pressure, too much pressure on everyone else. So are you... Would you, you would, I'm assuming just from what you said, keep, you would keep Julius over trading Julius for Mikel. Yeah, yeah. I, would, I wouldn't trade him straight up from the Calvary. So what, if, if I'm giving you the GM hat, yeah. I fired yeah. Leon Rose. Okay, he's gone. He did, you, Leon, you yeah. did a great job. We love you. We're going to give CP the job. Yeah. What big changes would you make, if any? Yeah. And just overall, what would your team look like next year? What would your priorities be? You can go through free AC, Hartenstein, OG, whatever you want. Give me your team next year. Yeah, priorities, re-sign OG at all costs. Resign yep. Hartenstein. At, at all costs. I think he brought a different dynamic to this Knicks team and to their offense that they haven't seen in a long time. And so I thought he emerged as a two-way player, not just, you know, just shooting offense or playing offense and, yep. and making good reads. I thought defensively and getting on the boards, he improved dramatically. And so he's going to deserve that raise. So you bring those two guys back, they need a backup point guard coming off the bench. Agreed. I was going to say that, yeah. They should have the mid-level exception. They should have it. And so you're going to have to look at some targets. Is it, you know, I don't really like this name. Is it a campaign? There's, there's not too many strong guys out there. You have D'Lo yeah. out there. I don't like him either. Tyus, Tyus Jones. Jones Tyus Jones. Get him from Washington. If you can get a tie, he's a free agent. You know, if you he's can a go, free agent. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, was, is he an option? I think he absolutely, solid. absolutely. Yeah. You, you go get a Tyus Jones. You put McBride off ball. I think that's yep. a that's a nice group right there. That's a nice group. You get smart and you put McBride in his natural role, which is in that off ball position, and you let him shoot it. Uh, they have two draft picks. I think they'll take one wing depth. Yeah. Um, well, they actually have three, including the, if three. You count the 38th pick. In the right, right. Round. If, if yeah. you want to count that one a second. So I think at the very least, they would probably use one of the two in the first round and then maybe consolidate the back two. Yeah. Go get a wing. Go get a wing. I want some upperclassmen, wing depth. We're going to get into our, our draft coverage on uh, on KFTV later on this or early next month. Mm-hmm. And so, um, but they need wing depth. I want upperclassmen, wing depth, someone who can go in there as plug and play ready, and that can add to that depth. 
And so until that big name emerges, th- those are the priorities, man. Just just add to the bench depth. You get Julius back and, and keep it pushing with, with that squad. So you you pretty much, and I, I think I agree with this too, unless you get the Giannis, the Duran, and maybe even the Booker, right? Yeah. You'd rather run it back with the team that you have. Make a couple yes. tweaks. I think adding the backup point guard, I think, is yeah. a huge thing. They need to alleviate some of the ball handling duties from Jalen. And I, and I think you're right. Deuce is, at least at this point of his career, is more suited off the ball. And he's yeah. a really good off the ball catch and shoot player and a d- obviously primary defender. But I don't think his his strengths are ball handling, bringing the ball to the court, taking that off of Jalen. So I think, especially in the playoffs, yeah, I think that's that's a need. I think you bring, bo- obviously, bogeys on the team for another year. You have mm-hmm. him. Well, and I think getting a win. Go so, ahead. so the bogey thing, it's it's not guaranteed. He's got a partial guarantee that they're going to they have to up, though, pick you? it up. Well, I think they will. And what could be interesting here is that because in the beginning when they first got him, I thought you know they're going to use him for the next blockbuster. Yeah. He could be used in a trade for sure. He could be used in a trade. So, yeah. are you looking at that potential 17, 18 million with some more draft picks to go get another? Not, not you know, all-star superstar play, but another OG type who yeah. with this team can help elevate this team by being a better fit, whether it's that bench back, a point guard or another wing. So that could be a wild card there. Again, there could be a name that we're not thinking of right now that you can use that salary of, of, of Bogdanovich plus some draft capital. They have a ton, ton. and maybe bring in somebody that we're not even thinking of. Where are you on Donovan Mitchell? Are you off him completely? I'm like 50 50. Me too. I'm like 50 50 50. He's one of my favorite players in the league. Me too. And I like um, he's from New York too. I love it. I love it. I love his game. But I'm I'm with the naysayers in that is a fit ideal with, with him and Jalen Brunson sharing the ball in the backcourt. I'm not so sure. And especially defensively, I think is what I'd be most concerned about. Def- defensively, the issues with between him and Darius Garland over the last two years in Cleveland, were they an ideal pairing? Why and why not? They seem to struggle. When yeah. they're together, but when they're on their own, they seem to shine, right? When Carla went out, Donovan Mitchell became this, you know, it's weird 2010 passing machine yeah. and then vice versa. So, um, you know, the fit is not ideal. Would I love it from a talent perspective? Sure. I'd, I'd root for it all day, every day. I think uh, it depends on the what you'd have to part with, right? Like yeah. that would make you think about it one way or the other. Absolutely. And then, you know, based on the people I'm, I spoke to and uh, Ian Begley and, and some other guys, it doesn't seem like... The per- they will be as hot after them as they were yeah. the previous time. Now, that could all change when they get into the offseason. Maybe Cleveland drops his asking price. Does he say, hey, it's New York or nowhere? Then, I mean, if you're getting Donovan Mitchell for the bogey contract, maybe and a, couple it, picks. and a couple picks, yeah, you might have to roll the dice away. I think, I do, like you said, at this point, I think we both agree. If they re-sign Hartenstein, and obviously that depends on, he's going to have to take less money, unfortunately. Because that, yeah. you know, kind of clause he had in his contract, they only gave him a two-year deal instead of a three-year deal, mm-hmm. which means they don't have his, his early bird rights, right. which means they can only give him, I think, a little over $18 million a year. Yeah, I think he'll get somewhere in that range. So it's a matter of a team may pay him 20 Will he come back to the Knicks for 18 and a half? That's going to be the question. But let's just go hypothetically yeah. that he resigns. I think you. I don't think you could keep both him and Mitch yeah. at that type of money. So I think, like you said, bogey. Mitch would be your couple of guys that you could package contract wise with picks to get a player that to add to the group, you know, a core guy to add to the group. And I think that would be if the, if it was bogey and Mitch and two, three pick first round picks. Oh God, I would, that would keep me up. I'm sorry. I, I, I would consider it. I would <laughs> yeah, I'm, still, do doing it. It. I'm probably, still doing it, man. Do it. And Lev, I don't have to give up Ju- Julius. Yeah. I, I think I have to do that. Right. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm still doing it, man. You, you got to take a gamble. I, I still think, I mean, look at what Kyrie and Luca are doing out there. I to know. me, it's you still need two stars to spearhead a legitimate run. I'm not talking about, yeah. you know, this team gets hurt and, and you luck your way into it. I'm talking about yeah. being bona fide, where at the end of this thing, you're holding that trophy up like, yeah, there's no doubt these guys were legit. You still need that talent upgrade. Is it Julius? Could it be someone else? You know, we know Brunson is going to play the part. We yes. know that. He's shown you two years in a row. He's bonafide he's a dog too we know that solid right you just need that second guy to emerge because i think this team has the pieces man they play defense they they rebound the hell out of the ball when they're healthy right they have the three-point shooting efficiency now with dante and og what mcbride came with mcbride i mean mcbride got his playing time based on the strength that he could shoot the ball 
because you knew defensively was was his floor. He was straight, but his shot was so erratic. It was so, you know, non-existent for many parts of his career. Now he's showing you he, he can knock it down. He, he did a complete 180 was, with the shot. Complete one. When he got more volume, he actually got better. Yeah, yeah. So I think they have it all, man. They have the one star. They just need one more. One more piece to add to that core, and I think they'll be all right. So speaking of Kyrie and Luka, assuming it's Mavs Celtics, because I think that's what everyone, that's what it looks like at this point. Who do you have in that series and why? Man, I think I think these Mavs are so hot right now. It's it's they're just on a wild run. They run. They just got there on that magic carpet ride. I think they're on a run. But you know what's going to be interesting because – it's going to be interesting because you have the best offensive backcourt that's going to be going up against the best defensive backcourt True. in the league. Who's going to give? Who's going to give there? But not only that, man, you know, Kyrie and Luka have, have been excellent. They've been clutch every time in the fourth quarter and those guys get the ball. They just take it up a notch. And that's what superstar players do, man. They're yep. able to raise their game to a level that the ordinary guys just can't get to. And that's how they separate themselves. But they're bigs have been playing really good basketball, man. The they Gafford the, the, tree. The, the tanking, you know, that we would have gotten their pick, and they took Lively, obviously, in the Gafford Major. tree. Too. But those two guys are, are just perfect for their team. Gafford was huge. And, you know, the thing is, when, you, when you're watching these guys on bad teams, I was always like, yeah, Graf, Gafford, he's all right. But because he's on such a crappy team like the Wizards, you don't really get to see their true impact. Yeah. On a team, and you know, last night another prime example. He's making clutch defensive stops in the fourth quarter there, and so I gotta go with the Mavs in seven. I'm gonna go with wow. the Mavs in seven well, on and, the road. And I'll say this: they've been a good road team in the playoffs. They have been. What's up with Kristaps? And and you know what the thing about that is too. I think everyone's just saying you could just when he comes back, he's just gonna be good. You know that calf strain. We've seen it. Yeah. Gian, Durant obviously a few years back in the Taurus Achilles, and yeah. obviously Giannis was not rushing back. And now with Kristaps, when he comes back, is he gonna be right? Is he on a minutes restriction? Like right. what's what's the, I agree, and that's a big that's a big loss for them yeah. because I think, and I'm asking you this as if you're a Celtics fan, are you concerned that they haven't been tested yet? Because yes. you know you look at. Miami, no Butler, no Rozier. That series is over. The, the Cavs was going to be tough to begin with. Then they lose uh, Donovan for two games, and they have no Jared Allen the whole series. That series was nothing. And now Indiana, they're a nice offensive team. They were never going to threaten them. And then they lose Halliburton in the third game. They blow the only Coach. game that they could have won in the first game. So the Celtics, to me, have just been coasting. They're going to have to play at their best level to beat Dallas in the finals. Would that concern you as a Celtics fan? Yeah, absolutely, man. They, this might be the lightest run to the NBA Finals that, that we've ever seen. Ever. I, I, honestly, ever. But ever. The, the one thing where, you know, I question with them is, do they have that killer instinct to, to put a good team away? Do if you put that on Tatum and Brown? When absolutely. You say that? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and more so Tatum. I, look, he's a, he's a great player, man. I'm not taking anything away from him. He's a great player. All the accolades that he's earned so far is well earned. I mean, how many times do they go to the conference finals? Those two guys, yeah. they yeah. built that thing for sure. I just don't like their execution down the stretch in a lot of these games, man. That first overtime game in game one when they beat the Pacers, in overtime, both those guys showed out, and Jalen Brown saved them in the end of the fourth quarter, taking the overtime. But if you look at their fourth quarter offense... That was a loss, first of all. Yeah. To me, I mean, they're chucking threes, left, right, and center. You're Jason Tater, man. You're six foot eight, six foot nine, towering over guys, and he's just... To me, his, his approach in crunch time is just way too soft. He almost had a, a boneheaded turnover in, the, in that game one win um, in the fourth quarter. But you look at, conversely, Luka Doncic and Kyrie, man. I mean, Dallas is getting it done without even shooting threes. Yeah. To me, they're the more clutch players. With Kyrie, he's got that championship experience. I, and I I'm think just he's got that chip to prove people Absolutely. that he's, you know, not the guy everyone thought he was the last seven years and, you know, basically being a detriment to any team he went yeah. to. He wants to prove, hey, I'm a winner. And I'm going to show that in these playoffs. And I agree with you. And I think what I see in Boston too, and I see this so much in Tatum because he's the best player and he's getting all, you know, he is going to get the credit or he's going to get the criticism. He looks tight. Tight. He looks like he's tight, got man. all the pressure. Yeah. He's feeling the pressure. You, you could see it, like you said, at the end of game one, the fourth quarter, he was bad in that fourth quarter. He yeah. played great in the overtime. Yeah. But yeah. that was, you know, they had to save him. Jalen had to save him to get there. He just looks like he's having no fun. 
He looks like he's playing tight. He looks like if he, he's, he feels that if he doesn't win a championship this year, the whole world's going cl- to cave in on him. Yeah, and I yeah. think that's, to me, yes, the softness and too many jump shots, which I agree with. I think it's coupled with this mentality where he's, he's feeling the pressure, and that's going to trickle down to the rest of the team. And I think one thing I said, I don't know if you know uh, Jared Dubin, yeah, you know, yeah, NBA yeah. sports writer, yeah. but he's a friend of mine. And I, yeah. I spoke to him, you know, off camera about the Celtics having too many guys of the same personality. Mm. You know, I think they're all really good players, but mm. they they don't have a guy that's like, like, you know what I mean? Like, not that they're not dogs, dogs but like yeah. the guy that's going to put dive on the floor for a loose ball, the guy, that, yeah. not necessarily vocally, but they had smart in that role mm-hmm. and they mm-hmm. lost him. And I don't think that was a bad thing. I understand they were going in a different direction and Drew's been amazing for them. And that's an upgrade. But they don't have that guy that when things are going downhill, can he galvanize the, as a leader? I don't know that they have that leader, that guy who's like a Brunson, like a heart, right? Like, I don't know if they have that. Do you agree with that? Do you see that in them? I think, I think Drew can be that guy. I think okay. he can be that guy. I mean, he made the clutch stop on on Nebhard in uh, in game three. And I'm looking at that stop at the end of the game. I'm like, number one, the anticipation was ridiculous. And number two, how many guys are going for that ball, given the game situation with the game on the line? That's Drew Holiday for you, man. Yeah. And, you know, game one, he, he was brilliant with 26 points. I think he can be that guy just by being the adult in the room, quote unquote, who's going to make a smart play for you. He's got to get the ball because that was another issue I had with them in that game. One win in the fourth quarter, he barely touched the ball and he was, he was having the best game of all. He's cooking. And, and when, when, you know, the Pacers are putting their toughest defenders on Tatum and Brown rightfully. So Drew holiday has an advantageous situation here where you're going up against a team. That's not that great defensively where he can use his championship, all defense mentality and, and offensive skill sets as well to take advantage. That's where I think if the Celtics do win, he once again has to be an X factor for them as a key decision maker in crunch time on both ends. I agree. All right. Before we let you get out of here, first of all, I really appreciate it. And, you know, for anyone who watches this and doesn't know, CP has been one of the great people to me as someone who appreciate started it. out in this industry and just been so good to me. And I appreciate that. I've been a fan of yours before we even spoke, but just really helping me as someone new in the, in this industry, new in media, you know, I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate it and how much you've given me no as problem. Just someone who's learned from you. So thank you for that. Mm-hmm. No problem. I'm going to give you a couple of Nick quick hitters mm-hmm. before I get you out of here. Mm-hmm. I'm going to give you an either or, and you pick one and we move on. Okay. Right? Mm-hmm. Mike Breen or Marv Albert? Breen. Okay. Yeah, Breen. Uh, Oakley or OG? Oak. Okay. Yeah. Leon Rose or Dave Checkers? Mm. I'll go check it. Check Ooh, it. Okay. Check it. I okay. Check it. Yeah. Better trade. You can only pick one. Okay. Hart or OG? OG. Okay. I think so too. Yeah. More painful moment. Mm-hmm. Charles Smith, the Ewing finger roll, mm-hmm. the Starks two for 18, or the Reggie Miller eight points in nine seconds? Two for 18. Two for I agree. 18. Yeah. Because that yeah. was where they were the closest to the title. Heartbreaker. Heartbreaker. Yeah. Um, okay, better moment. Mm-hmm. Starks dunk, LJ four point play. Four point play. Better three point Selly. Brunson yep. with the yep. kiss mm-hmm. or mellow three to the dome. Three to the dome. I, I gotta I think go I three agree. to the dome. Definitely. I think I agree. Yeah. Okay, two more. Better jerseys, the city jerseys mm-hmm. or the statement jerseys? The statement ones with the Jordan logo? Yeah. Oh, throw those in the garbage. Yeah, 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 anything with hard. the Jordan logo, throw it in the hard. garbage. We'll, we'll go with the city joints. Okay, and last yeah. one. The two most underappreciated Nick all-star greats, I would say. Mm-hmm. Spreewell or Houston? They're right behind me, man. Uh, I feel pressure. Uh, damn. You can call a tie if you want. I can't call a tie, man. It's I agree. I'm just giving you, I'm giving you an uh, out. I'm giving you an uh, out. Give me Houston. Houston. Okay. Yeah, I'm going spree okay. by a slight margin, but I'm going spree. All right, all right, hey, all right. I appreciate you. Thank you so much Anytime, for coming man. on. We'll obviously chat soon, and you know, listen, let's let's see what happens in the off season. Hopefully, we can chat during free agency when things start to happen. For sure, keep me posted, man. It's great work, great season, and uh, yeah, man, let's catch up again in the off season and beyond. I appreciate that, and check out CP on Knicks Fan TV at Knicks Fan TV. Are you on TikTok also, by the way? 
Yeah, Nick Sand TV, yeah, okay. Nick Sand TV, TikTok, YouTube, um, IG, everywhere. Yes. Yep. Okay. Cool. Check him out. He's the best in the business. The best Nick fan there is, and we appreciate him coming on. Thank you, CP. Anytime, man. Thank you, bro. All right, bro.